Hey guys, what's up? And welcome to a new episode of Veil Lifted. So as you can see, my background is a new background. It's still a work in progress. Anyway, today we are going to be talking about a cult, so I want to put a little trigger warning here. There will be mentions of death, and there will be mentions of suicide, so just beware of that. When we hear about cults, we often conjure the same few images and ideas. Religion, difficult childhoods, manipulation, and often extremely inflated egos. Time and time again, we hear of gurus who claim to have some kind of power and knowledge that is unattainable to the masses unless you buy their book, unless you move to a commune they started, unless you pay a certain amount of money. We know how to spot the red flags. Yet these individuals continue to exist, taking advantage of innocent people who simply were looking for answers. Here we can begin to discuss a truly bizarre cult, conscious development. Terry Lee Benson Wilder Johnson Hoffman was born in Dallas, Texas in 1938. Hoffman had a difficult and bizarre childhood. She grew up poor, without much money for the essentials such as clothes and food. She was bullied by other children. Her mother suffered from tragedies as well, giving birth to a stillborn little girl. Later on, she suffered with tuberculosis which ended up taking her life. Amongst all this turmoil, a four-year-old Terry Hoffman began to have visions. Three robed men appeared to her, relaying the cosmic message that she could do and be anything she wanted, especially if she wanted it ardently. This message is not inherently negative, as even today, many children are still taught to dream and to aspire for better. This message could have contributed to an entirely positive existence and impact on others, However, as time went on, it became toxic. At age nine, Hoffman was admitted to a Lutheran orphanage. Much like in her younger years, she continued to be bullied by the children around her. Again, the three robed men appeared to her and shared another message with her, to think about God anytime she felt hopeless. This is when faith became an integral part of her life. She began praying, had visions of God, and all of this was furthered by a Lutheran nun who taught her about cosmic records that Hoffman could only access in the spiritual realm the Akashic records. The nun also informed her on topics of meditation and reincarnation. The meditation was the gateway to Hoffman allegedly seeing the past, present, and future. While these beliefs may not have been inherently negative, again, if taken too easily, they could lead to deluded behavior. In fact, before leaving the orphanage, Hoffman's identity had shifted. She believed that she was the reincarnation of Saint Teresa of Avila. Saint Teresa was a Carmelite nun known for being a mystic, a religious reformer, author, and was referred to as Doctor of the Church. She earned this title as she believed in mental prayer, which consists of meditating on the teachings of God and Christ's face. Saint Teresa had a colorful life that in some ways would be paralleled in Hoffman's. After two years at the orphanage, Hoffman was adopted and given the name we now know her by. There seemed to be an instant connection between herself and the couple as they had lost their daughter to tuberculosis. However, as she grew up, Hoffman began to feel overwhelmed by her adoptive mother's suffocating attention. This may have contributed to why Hoffman got married young to John Wilder, whom she'd met in junior high. He had dropped out and worked as a truck driver. Unsurprisingly, Hoffman's adoptive parents, her mother especially, were not fans of Wilder and did not deem him as good enough for their daughter. Hoffman married Wilder in 1953, right as she turned 15. A year and a half later, their first child was born, a boy named Kenneth. Five years later, their second child, a daughter, was born, named Virginia. For many years in her marriage, Hoffman played her role as a mother and a housewife. These were likely to be the least eventful years of her life as she was living according to social convention. It seems Hoffman became restless in her role and desired more from life than what society dictated was right for her. She therefore began to meet with other individuals who shared her interests of meditating and discussing topics such as larger questions in life, how the universe functioned, the meaning of truth, and so on. These conversations opened a door for Hoffman, the occult, hypnotism, and power of positive thinking groups. John Wilder alleges he didn't know when the exact shift occurred, but it may have been when Hoffman first began to read about hypnotism or her exposure to high society women who discussed such topics at the Brookhaven Country Club. Unfortunately, these women were what reignited Hoffman's belief that she was a superior being. They saw her as a messenger of God. The positive impact Hoffman would have on one specific individual would propel her career in spirituality. Hoffman helped a young man through his addiction to drugs. She claims to have done this through meditation and prayer. After his recovery, the young man pleaded that Hoffman share her knowledge with his friends. 
she ended up having weekly meditation sessions that were attended predominantly by high schoolers. Hoffman didn't charge for the sessions, but it is telling that young impressionable minds were attracted to her alleged powers. Hoffman's teachings were centered on balance and perspective. She discussed the archangels who could offer protection and fortitude, as well as the law of karma, which offered the comforting idea that goodness would receive goodness and that evil would soon be in debt for their wrongdoings. These sessions were relatively harmless. Hoffman would lead a meditation that seemed to mirror a form of hypnosis and claimed they were on their way to a higher spiritual plane where Christ was a master, as were Buddha, Lao Tzu, Muhammad, and others. During these hypnotic sessions, Hoffman would lead the students spiritually through higher realms. She would describe the scenery of the different realms, the emotional, the logical, the ether, and the soul. The students allegedly felt as though they were looking at what she was describing and would comment on the appearance of realms, adding descriptors that Hoffman would typically agree with. On top of this, Hoffman informed her students about cosmic Akashic records that could only be accessed spiritually. She went as far as to claim that she could tell who their soulmate was and had insight on their love lives. Hoffman made many bold claims, such as referring to a night where she allegedly levitated from her body. She also claimed that her son Kenneth had dislocated his thumb and that she'd cured him through meditation. Slowly, these sessions became more worrisome as Hoffman began to refer to deaths in order to show her powers and her sight into the past or future. When Jimi Hendrix died, she claimed he had bad karma due to drug use and that his soul required a higher plane. Apparently, these visions also became materialistic, where Hoffman began to boast about goods in her life, such as an allegedly new boat. This made some students of hers leave due to sudden skepticism. However, the more tragic aspect was the demise of her marriage. This was a turning point, as by the late 60s, the group titled Conscious Development of Body, Mind, and Soul began, led by none other than Hoffman. Hoffman was accepting payments or love offerings and private consultations, which sometimes would bring her $50 to $100 at a time. All of this drove Hoffman and her husband apart. He didn't believe in her so-called powers and became uncomfortable with her new practices and students or disciples. One student became particularly close to Hoffman. His name was Glenn Cooley, a university student. He was particularly adamant on being near her during sessions. This was Hoffman and Wilder's breaking point. She eventually filed for divorce on December 28, 1970. This was also the same time when Hoffman was taken to a psychiatric hospital in order to be evaluated. She was soon released, though she lost custody of her two children. Soon enough, Hoffman married Cooley with a 13-year age gap of 20 and 33 respectively. Another close follower or student named Sandy Cleaver followed them. Cleaver's reality was in some ways not so dissimilar to Hoffman's. They had difficulties in their marriage and clearly had the same beliefs in terms of the spiritual. But aside from that, they were opposites in terms of upbringing, economic status, academic status, and personality. Though her marriage was in trouble, Cleaver had a daughter with her husband, Chuck. As time went on, she became unsure of herself as a mother, causing understandable turmoil. This turmoil was only worsened by the death of her father, with whom she felt she had loose ends. This is what made her dive even deeper into spirituality, homeopathy, crystal healing, amongst other non-traditional beliefs. Unfortunately, these beliefs caused Cleaver to lose a grasp on reality. She began to obsess over homeopathy to the point that she'd have pills sent to her from Mexico. She traveled to San Diego to put her daughter in a machine that allegedly pushed away quote unquote bad vibrations. The pills, when inspected by actual medical doctors, were proven to be placebos with no scientific backing to prove they had any healing force. Cleaver's belief truly became dangerous when her daughter became sick. She had been sweating profusely in her sleep and had a high fever. Chuck, Cleaver's husband, insisted they bring their daughter to the doctor. However, Cleaver was too far gone into her new reality, one where she thought medical doctors were frauds. She went as far as to say that maybe it would be better if their daughter just went to heaven. This is where Hoffman's influence is exemplified. Hoffman claimed she could diagnose illnesses and went as far as to claim she could cure cancer. Chuck Cleaver did not like Hoffman, but mostly bit his tongue until it became clear that the path his wife was on was unpredictable and perilous. Hoffman said she could put a protective shield around Cleaver's sick daughter that would allegedly protect her from everything except Chuck's quote unquote bad vibrations. In the Hoffman household, things weren't as serene as they might have appeared. Terry Hoffman ended up filing for a divorce, claiming her husband was impeding her spiritual journey. Soon after, Cleaver divorced her husband, also claiming he was impeding her spiritual growth. Hoffman and Cleaver became inseparable and Cleaver became deeply involved in conscious development. She helped make jewelry that they sold to members. She also helped write lessons that became part of conscious development. Conscious development was really taking off and in fact was attracting significant attention from many in the Southwest. Per usual in cult stories, 
Hoffman attracted good-hearted people who wanted to better themselves and those who had undergone some kind of tragedy or difficulty in their lives. As conscious development grew, more people became part of the staff. One of these people was named Janine Schneider, who became executive director. Though much like the others, Schneider was enamored with Hoffman, she was well-versed in spirituality and began to see that Hoffman was lifting the work of multiple philosophers. Apparently at times, when telling members about their past lives, Hoffman would quote, word by word, biographies from books. Obviously, she framed everything as her own special knowledge. Cult-like aspects of conscious development began to become clear to Schneider. Hoffman was not separating conscious development donations and her own money. They were one and the same to her, money she could use as she pleased. On top of this, Hoffman's belief that she was St. Teresa grew into thinking she was a master of revelations, much like Christ. The practices also began to shift. Suddenly, members were sworn to secrecy and Hoffman continued to aggrandize herself. The once positive thinking type of group conscious development was, was shifting abruptly. Hoffman introduced Black Lords. Black Lords were forces of evil that could be found only in the spiritual realm. The job of conscious development was to fight them. Hoffman named 40 members of Conscious Development as teachers and told them the spiritual masters had told her they were specifically selected to fight against the Black Lords. This new battle gave way to meetings in which the teachers would meet with Hoffman, bringing items and performing protection spells. One of the items was the rod. People brought anything similar to a rod, such as a car antenna, then would proceed to swish them like swords in battle. Hoffman told them they were effectively killing Black Lords. Though the meetings began as scheduled weekly, as time went on, the meetings became sporadic and ever more urgent. The battle against the Black Lords became consistently more intense with more alleged dangers and more to fight against. Hoffman was creating anxiety within conscious development via these battles, making members ever more vulnerable. Though Black Lords until then had only been in the spiritual realm, the teachers and Hoffman claimed during battles that the spirits of former members were there and to be fought. They were now Black Lords. Interestingly, these battles began shortly after Glenn Cooley had killed himself. It turns out that what Hoffman had claimed as a reason for her divorce, that her husband was stunting her spiritual development, wasn't true. She also claimed her divorce was amicable, but this does not align with the fact that Cooley asked the courts for speedy processing of their divorce. Less than a week later, he was dead. Apparently Cooley had been wanting to leave conscious development. However, Hoffman was extremely controlling to the point where when Cooley went to visit his family, she'd call after less than half an hour or actually drive to get him. Unsurprisingly, his family did not approve of Hoffman. Though Cooley's death was called a suicide, there were extremely strange circumstances around his death. Firstly, a mere two weeks prior to his death, Hoffman had asked him for the title to their house. Secondly, Hoffman claimed to have found a note written by Cooley in which he asks that his earthly possessions go to her. The wording of the sledged will was very strange. It read, I, Glenn Cooley, give to Terry Cooley all of my property, both personal and real. This includes two boats, a 1972 Buick Limited, all jewelry and equipment for its making, all furnishings for the house on Dunhaven Road, and all cash. I ask that this last will of mine not be contested by anyone in any way for any reason. Last but not least, I give all my love to my family and friends. As explanation for all this, I can't really say what it is because of, but I can say what it is not because of. It is not because of divorce with Terry, past drug experiences, inability to cope, etc. What it is, I myself know, but don't have the words for. Once investigated, his death was ruled as a drug overdose as they found Valium and Librium in his blood analysis. A third strange element surrounding his death occurred at his funeral. Cooley's mother stated that Hoffman's behavior was not typical of a person grieving. This is obviously to be taken with a grain of salt as grief does not present in the same way for everyone. However, what is objectively at least questionable is that as Hoffman cried, she constantly looked to see Cooley's mother's reaction. A fourth strange aspect of Cooley's death is that Hoffman had no issue threatening to air out his past drug use when she found out the family might testify against her in probate court. This does not seem consistent with someone grieving to be willing to speak ill of them after their death. The situation within conscious development continued to devolve and Cooley's death only made it more extreme. Some of the members left conscious development as it grew darker and darker, even leading to bloodletting. Hoffman claimed that they needed to let out blood as it was allegedly being poisoned by the Black Lords. This practice was very similar to that of the Middle Ages, where people believed bloodletting would help the sick. Hoffman continued down this path that seemed to consistently become more consumed in darkness and pain. As people continued to leave conscious development, Hoffman and Cleaver became closer, 
perhaps as a method for Hoffman to maintain control. In order to secure her position of power with Cleaver, Hoffman claimed that Cleaver's daughter had been taken over by dark energy and that she was, quote unquote, a negative being. Setting this fear and anxiety in Cleaver was an easy way to keep her close and for her to feel that she needed Hoffman's guidance. In fact, this closeness equated in both Cleaver and her daughter giving all their money to Hoffman. They both wrote wills, leaving Hoffman with $125,000, which was Cleaver's daughter's inheritance, and $20,000 a year, which was Cleaver's inheritance. This was on top of the Cleaver house and valuable art pieces. Much like Cooley, there were suspicious circumstances around the wills. Cleaver's daughter was a minor, therefore the law in Texas then would not allow her to write a will. Secondly, she apparently had written two wills, and the language in the two varied greatly. One will sounded like the 13-year-old girl she was, while the other was written in pure legal jargon. Additionally, the wills interestingly asked to not be contested, much like Cooley's. To make this all the more bizarre, Cleaver's daughter claimed Hoffman was like a second mother in a will, but this was highly contested by a friend who claimed she was embarrassed of conscious development and that she thought it was just weird. Her friend also claims her relationship with her mother was strained and conscious development was a big contributor in that department. Cleaver's daughter named Devereaux suffered an untimely death at the age of 14. Her and her mother had gone to Hawaii as a pre-wedding celebration with Cleaver's fiance. They went in shallow waters that were surrounded by coral reefs. It seemed safe enough until a large wave hit them. Cleaver held on to Devereaux, but the wave separated them. Cleaver claims that she looked underwater to find Devereaux, but then passed out and woke up on a large rock with no Devereaux in sight. Cleaver was rushed to the hospital. Initially, she displayed the behavior of a mourning mother in shock, but once Hoffman arrived, she returned to the quote unquote, Devereaux will be better in heaven narrative. After Devereaux's death, Cleaver isolated herself from everyone except Hoffman. She even called off her wedding. Cleaver was melting down, her usual habits were no longer, and she refused to listen to anyone, warning her about Hoffman, even her own brother. In fact, this erratic behavior resulted in her taking out a $300,000 life insurance policy that was payable to none other than Hoffman. Cleaver also decided to gift Hoffman with all of her earthly goods. However, this would only take effect once Cleaver died. She also decided to write a new will, once more with Hoffman as a sole recipient. Cleaver's friend, Wheezy Watson, also wrote a will naming Cleaver as her estate's executrix, naming Hoffman as second executrix. This would make those close to Watson suspicious as apparently she didn't like Hoffman. Soon after, Cleaver and Watson would go to Colorado to visit land Hoffman had recently bought. Though usually Cleaver had her neighbors look in on her cat and mow the lawn when she was gone, before she left for Colorado, she changed her locks. On their second day in Colorado, Watson and Cleaver went to inspect the land Hoffman had bought. Between then and when they were found, nobody knows what occurred. The next day, their car was spotted at the foot of a 450 foot cliff. Both Watson and Cleaver were dead. Strangely, there was no sign of an accident, no skid marks or tracks to indicate loss of control. Cleaver's brother, Kroom Beatty, had a feeling something was wrong, that these deaths were not coincidences and that Hoffman had a suspicious track record. His attorney filed to contest Cleaver's will as she was not of sound mind and could not make decisions for herself and that she was under psychological control of Hoffman. At the trial, Hoffman admitted to using tranquilizers, that money was in her bank account instead of going towards conscious development and that she had tried to influence multiple witnesses. Conveniently, when asked about conscious development teachings, Hoffman claimed to not be aware of or remember them. Mary Ellen Grundman, a psychotherapist hypnotist, was introduced as an expert to give testimony. She claimed that hypnosis would be rather easy to perform on people, even without their consent, when said people trusted you fully. Grundman also claimed that this hypnosis could cause said people to commit self-destructive acts even at another time without the presence of Hoffman. Hoffman panicked on the sixth day of trial and ended up paying Beatty $50,000 right then and then $62,500 at a later date. After this, life went relatively back to normal for Hoffman. However, the movement was faced with extremely bad publicity and to make it all the more tragic, three out of four of the members who testified for Hoffman killed themselves. Though conscious development was still operating, Hoffman also began performing acupressure massages and she founded a perfume mixing company. Sandy Cleaver's death had taken a massive toll on Hoffman, contributing to the dwindling future of conscious development. Though Hoffman no longer held her formal spiritual meetings with her followers, those who stuck by her socialized often, including parties and retreats. Even for those who left, her influence on their lives seemed to be imprinted 
they weren't going to get away from her. Though conscious development still existed, many of the members were taking their own continued spiritual paths. It was no longer the united group it began as. Another important character in the story of conscious development is a woman named Robin Ostot. Robin had become an integral part of conscious development once the Sandy Cleaver trial was underway. She took over the duties that typically were Cleaver's responsibilities, such as writing the courses. Ostot was entirely at the mercy of Hoffman and her so-called teachings. In fact, she filled her home with protective talismans such as gnome-style dolls against the Black Lords. However, it could be said that with Ostot, Hoffman went significantly farther than she had with her other matchmaking games. This specific example shows that Hoffman was either removed from reality or enjoyed creating chaos in the life of others, or perhaps both. Hoffman set Ostot up with a 41-year-old man who worked for the CIA. There was just one issue. He did not exist. He was a supernatural being. Later on, Ostot's journals were found where she detailed what seemed to be an entirely regular relationship with the CIA man, as if he weren't a supernatural being. Much like the other conscious development members, Ostot distanced herself even from the son she used to dote on and entirely invested herself even further into conscious development. Little else is known about Ostot and how her relationship with the Invisible Man continued. Though the Cleaver trial had painted Hoffman in a majorly negative light, and rightfully so, there were still people who believed in her and were effectively in her corner. One of these people had testified for her positively during the trial. He was a business professor named David Allen Goodman. Goodman's defense of conscious development relied on an overly positive portrayal of the group's practices and Hoffman's intentions. He described the group as a place where people merely met to have discussions on shared interests and focused on having positive attitudes towards life. Goodman was a highly accomplished man, having earned an MBA from Berkeley. After obtaining his degree, many higher education institutions offered Goodman positions, institutions such as Harvard. A close friend of Goodman's, Bruce Buchanan, described him as a seeker. Buchanan is quoted as saying, he would go to various discussion groups the way you or I might go to the movies. According to Buchanan, this act of seeking was deeply contrasting with Goodman's academic mindset, where his focus was on the concrete, such as numbers and evidence. Though Goodman's life seemed to be entirely successful, in 1970, after 10 years of marriage, his wife, Peggy, left him. Though Goodman's academic career was proceeding incredibly profitably, including even winning awards, his split with Peggy took a predictably immense toll on his well-being. Due to this divorce, Goodman began to attend spiritual meetings of different varieties in order to try to heal his wounds. This is what led Goodman to Hoffman in 1973. He very quickly became an attached regular and continued to attend the meetings, even spending $150 a month on counseling. Hoffman soon became referred to by Goodman as his own personal guru. Though Goodman's parents were happy to see him doing better, it is important to note that in the past they'd said he'd shown a poor judgment in regards to people and their intentions. Goodman took Hoffman's advice very strongly to heart, to the point where he trusted her supposed clairvoyance in terms of romantic relationships, even after his devastating divorce from Peggy. Hoffman's guidance proved unsuccessful. In 1973, Goodman married a 23-year-old student. Surprise, surprise, Hoffman conducted the ceremony. The couple lasted two years, and not even a year after, Goodman married again, for the third time, again to a 24-year-old student. Ironically, Hoffman had proclaimed that the last marriage would be the one and that they were destined to spend many lives together. The third marriage lasted three years. Though Goodman had always been synonymous with academic work, whether it be publishing papers or winning awards, Hoffman had changed things for him. He became disengaged with his work, and even his own colleagues began to distance themselves from him as he was viewed as strange and detached. In fact, he was unraveling at the seams in even the most basic ways. He stopped wearing the dress code, he wouldn't even attend meetings. This became an even bigger problem when a new dean became appointed at the university. Luckily, a chairman encouraged that Goodman work with another professor. In two years' time, he was back in good graces, this time of the business world, as they had written papers and books about stock picking and the market. However, the success wasn't for his own sake. 
Goodman was merely finding a way to leave the university and having a new financial avenue was necessary. Apparently, those at the university were not concerned with what mattered in life. As mentioned prior, aside from conscious development courses, Hoffman was now offering many other services, one of which was creation of perfume. However, the list was long. She also made jewelry, offered acupressure massage therapy, and also viewed herself as a financial advisor. In fact, she told her followers what career paths they should take or change to. As she had prior, Hoffman brought Goodman a new wife, Glenda Carlson. Carlson was very different than Goodman's two prior wives. Carlson was his age and had raised kids of her own, therefore she'd had significant life experiences before him. Much like him as well, she was a seeker. Her friends described her as a person who was always looking for more, never stopping, which is what led her to Hoffman. Within about a year of dating, Goodman and Carlson got married. Again, Hoffman conducted the ceremony, though this time, Goodman's parents were beginning to resent the so-called teachings Hoffman was indoctrinating into her followers. In fact, they were truly horrified to find out that Carlson's two daughters were essentially being disposed of. Her son had been living with his father, while the two daughters had stayed with her and Goodman. In order to focus all of their energy on growing spiritually, the daughters needed to be out of the way as Goodman saw them as mere distractions. Therefore, the girls were taken out of school and sent to live with their father. Initially, they were close enough in Houston, but the father was soon transferred to Singapore. From then on, they made a rule where their daughters could only visit two weeks a year. Carlson's mother, Lorraine, said that was when the real Glenda died. Once more, Hoffman's influence, though indirect, caused internal turmoil for a family and a loss of perspective for the conscious development followers. Sending the girls away was only the first step for Goodman and Carlson. Their next step was to completely distance themselves from anyone who wasn't part of the conscious development cult. They feared that those that they came in contact with, including family, would bring negative energies, secluding themselves entirely from anyone and everyone. Glenda Goodman had even written a letter to her son saying she was deeply depressed and she wished she had the nerve to kill herself. This letter was never sent and was found crumpled in the garbage. Glenda and David wrote in journals about their metaphysical experiences. Though there was no suicide note found and the journals didn't explicitly state that they planned to kill themselves, there were definite undertones that suggested they had some grim plans. The journals detailed that they spoke to God through the earthly messenger that was Hoffman. It also turned out that Hoffman had given the Goodmans mind-altering white pills that supposedly helped to bring them into the spiritual world and experience the metaphysical. Much like the other victims of Hoffman's, in Glenda's journal, she vowed to leave Hoffman half of their future earnings, which would end up totaling in $110,000. In 1989, the Goodmans were found dead with guns held pressed to their heads. The investigators believed the suicides weren't entirely planned as they had not made any plans for the care of their dogs who had been out on the lawn for weeks. The Goodmans had been dead for about a month when they were found. Needless to say, this brought Hoffman national attention and a criminal investigation was launched against her. Through the tumultuous adventure that was conscious development, Hoffman managed to control multiple people, get significant amounts of money, and was eerily connected to many deaths. The criminal investigation went on for four years. Unfortunately, the prosecutors were not able to credibly ascertain who to pin the deaths on. This can be viewed as confusing, considering that between 1979 and 1990, 10 of Hoffman's followers died. Out of these 10, six were alleged suicides and four were alleged accidents. It's also important to note that out of the suicides, two were her husbands. Out of these deaths, a significant amount of the dead had left Hoffman sizable amounts of money or the equivalent via homes, famous art pieces, etc. Hoffman faced up to 50 years on bankruptcy fraud charges. Not much of a consolation for the families of the victims, but at least a form of consequence. Unfortunately, she was only sentenced to 16 months and ended up being released after a mere year. After her release, Hoffman remarried and changed her name, likely to distance herself from all the negative publicity, to say the least, that surrounded her. As of 1995, her name was Terry Lilia Keenly. Hoffman, now referred to as Keenly, faded into the darkness in terms of what is known about her continued life after conscious development. 
She continued to write and published a book that seems to merge the metaphysical with financial advice. To this day, on Amazon, you can purchase that text titled, The Colors of Money, Finding Your Money Force. Keenly died in 2015. The last few years of her life are vastly undocumented online, remaining mysteries. Perhaps all that had occurred with conscious development had taken a toll. Or perhaps she continued her trajectory as a guru, this time more secretly to avoid more criticism and so she could continue to collect money from followers. One thing is certain though, all of those who became close to conscious development and Hoffman slash Keenly found their lives unraveling or even ending.